I'm Shane Kilgalley. And I'm Kyle Thompson. I'm Bob Neubauer. And you're listening to General Intellect Unit. This time we are talking about Act 5 of Kentucky Route Zero. This is the end of the series. And we are joined by Bob, uh, returning champion of uh, General Intellect Unit. Bob, how's it going? Uh, pretty good. You know, super super happy to, to be here. It was, it was a blast to um, uh, get through this game. Like, I, I uh, played... Um, uh, the first few uh, uh, episodes years and years ago and was always excited and wanted to, to catch back up to it. So this was a great opportunity. And so I really, really, really had had, had fun with it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so uh, quick, quick impressions of Acts 1 through 4, maybe? Well, it was a real trip doing it all, doing them all together because I had played Acts 1 and 2 previously and I really loved them and I was always, it was always a plan, uh, I always just planned to um, uh, play through the rest when they, when they came out, right? And they just sort of passed me by, like I always was going to go back to them and um, what was really interesting, like, it, it was... Uh, because like Act One and Two are so surreal, like you, you like, um, but and, and they're very, uh, they, they are dark, um, but they're but it, they're not as uniformly dark as uh, maybe not uniformly dark, but they're not as as uh, dark, and the themes aren't as as crushingly obvious as when you get to Act Three and Four, where things really go off the rails with the the hard. Uh, hard times whiskey and the like the the whiskey for debt for uh, e- e- eternal servitude scheme of Conway and watching what's going to happen with Conway and all the time spent underground. Um, so uh, it would that was a real trip, right? To get to that point, like by by like for the first two of them, I was I was I remember things like oh this is this is like magical realism, but with three and four, I was just kind of like. Oh, this is this this is magical capitalist realism. Mm-hmm. It's nightmare right? realism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you just so you just get this kind of uh, grim. Um, uh, you really just you, it becomes it's like really engrossing, um, but but quite uh, but, but you know fairly grim. Um, even as it becomes you know the world is extremely enchanting and exciting, and so like uh, to to explore. And so I think there was some. I was really excited to see what would happen with five, um, because uh, you know by the end of. Four, it's like you know, it's like Con- Conway is now turned into like a, a skeleton ghost static uh, debt peon machine that he's going. On, he's off to the hard times whiskey factory, and uh, you just meet um, all these individuals who are living underground, like first on off the zero and then off the echo. Um, as I was mentioning before. Uh, we started recording, right? Like I, I remember finding the the restaurant uh, on on Lake Leith um, uh, particularly intense because they're so happy to be having this autonomous life uh, down below. Like, you know, cooking. You know, like they put all this pride and creativity into their their menu, but they're just uh, you know just eating uh, hagfish and like subterranean uh, uh, cuttlefish uh, spreads and, and and so on, right? Um, and so uh, that really set up very nicely, like playing all that through to get to the beginning of Act 5, where you have this um, almost relative to Acts 3 and 4, this kind of explosion of color, um, and you're out in the open again after the storm. Um, uh, it was really, really, uh, uh, really set the stage really nicely. Right? Yeah. And, and, and changed the tone without abandoning the previous tone. Absolutely. Right. And I, I just, uh, I appreciate you bringing up the... Um bring up the, the, the sort of uh, ingredients at the restaurant there, because that's something that didn't really hit us very hard. Uh, but now that you mention it, it is really intense. Uh, just the sort of privation that those people are living in. Maybe, it might just be because I like, co- like I really like to cook at like, um, and that's one of the things, you know, like everyone baking bread and stuff, right? Like that's one of the things that I've, I've been keeping myself busy with the pandemic, right? And so I'm just sitting there, uh, you know, it was like, oh, this, you know, they're talking about their amazing menu. And then it's just like, oh, the candied fish eye and the, and the, 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 the freshwater cuttlefish spread. And it's not, it's never even mentioned what, what they're spreading it on. You know, like, you know, it's, it's, uh, you don't know. Um, and so that was, I remember that would really stuck me, you know, in, in a way um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, there was a lot, there was, there was lots that, that, that popped out at me, but that, I remember that moment. You. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and you're you're right. It's it's been fantastically grim up to this point, and it's. Um, I think this is still a downer ending, but this this takes it away from like the seventh seal levels of grimness to a slightly different flavor of grim, um, that is maybe maybe uplifting as well as like a downer. Um, 
But yeah, so this is the final act. It was published in uh, January of 2020, and it was it was published alongside the TV edition. Like, so it was a big bang sort of reveal for like the final edition of the game. Um, and weirdly, there's this kind of trick to it where if you finish this Act 5 and then start again from Act 1, meet Carrington, then go back out to the menu, you'll find that there's actually an extra uh, interlude, although it's not really an interlude. It's an interlude between Acts 5 and 1. Uh, the title of that is Death of the Hired Man. Um, and the structure of that thing very closely mirrors the poem that's been mentioned all through the game, Death of the Hired Man by Robert Frost. Um, so Kyle, do you want to read this thing out? Because it does seem to be actually very, very important to the plot and how this works out here. Yeah, absolutely. They really uh, focus on this poem a lot in Act 5 and then in the final uh, interlude there. Uh, so I will just uh, go ahead and read this. Uh, if you wanted to read along with it, uh, you can just easily find it through Google on the Poetry Foundation website. Uh, and it's, it's nicely all laid out there for you. Um, it's also annotated. Uh, so if you want to get like references or anything like that um, out of it, uh, just like, uh, what is it called? Like a uh, lyric genius or or whatever, like they've got something similar for this here, so uh, pretty handy. All right, so uh, the death of the hired man. Mary sat musing on the lamp flame at the table, waiting for Warren. When she heard his step, she ran on tiptoe down the darkened passage to meet him in the doorway with the news and put him on his guard. Silas is back. She pushed him outward with her through the door and shut it after her. Be kind, she said. She took the market things from Warren's arms and set them on the porch, then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps. When was I ever anything but kind to him? But I'll not have the fellow back, he said. I told him so last haying, didn't I? If he left then, I said, that ended it. What good is he? Who else will harbor him at his age for the little he can do? What help he is, there's no depending on. Off he goes always when I need him most. He thinks he ought to earn a little pay, enough at least to buy tobacco with, so he won't have to beg and be beholden. All right, I say. I can't afford to pay any fixed wages, though I wish I could. Someone else can. Then someone else will have to. I shouldn't mind his bettering himself, if that was what it was. You can be certain when he begins like that, there's someone at him trying to coax him off with pocket money in haying time when any help is scarce. In winter... He comes back to us. I'm done. Shh, not so loud. He'll hear you, Mary said. I want him to. He'll have to soon or late. He's worn out. He's asleep beside the stove. When I came up from Rose, I found him here, huddled against the barn door fast asleep. A miserable sight and frightening too. You needn't smile. I, I didn't recognize him. I wasn't looking for him, and he's changed. Wait till you see. Where did you say he'd been? He didn't say. I dragged him to the house and gave him tea and tried to make him smoke. I tried to make him talk about his travels. Nothing would do. He just kept nodding off. What did he say? Did he say anything? But little. Anything? Anything? Mary, confess. He said he'd come to ditch the meadow for me. Warren! But did he? I just want to know. Of course he did. What would you have him say? Surely you wouldn't grudge the poor old man some humble way to save his self-respect. He added, if you really care to know, he meant to clear the upper pasture too. That sounds like something you've heard before? Warren, I wish you could have heard the way he jumbled everything. I stopped to look two or three times. 
He made me feel so queer to see if he was walking, talking in his sleep. He ran on Harold Wilson, you remember, the boy you had in Haying four years since. He's finished school and teaching in his college. Silas declares you'll have to get him back. He says they two will make a team for work. Between them, they will lay this farm as smooth. The way he mixed that in with other things. He thinks young Wilson a likely lad, though daft on education. You know how they thought. All through July, under the blazing sun, Silas up on the cart to build the load, Harold along beside to pitch it on. Yes, I took care to keep well out of earshot. Well, those days trouble Silas like a dream. You wouldn't think they would. How some things linger. Harold's young college boy's assurance piqued him. After so many years, he still keeps finding good arguments he sees he might have used. I sympathize. I know just how it feels to think of the right thing to say too late. Harold's associated in his mind with Latin. He asked me what I thought of Harold's saying. He studied Latin like the violin because he liked it. That an argument. He said he couldn't make the boy believe he could find water with a hazel prong, which showed how much good school had ever done him. He wanted to go over that, but most of all, he thinks if he could have another chance to teach him how to build a load of hay. I know that Silas is one accomplishment. He bundles every forkful in its place and tags and numbers it for future reference so he can find and easily dislodge it in the unloading. Silas does that well. He takes it out in bunches like big bird's nests. You never see him standing on the hay. He's trying to lift, straining to lift himself. He thinks if he could teach him that, he'd be some good, perhaps, to someone in the world. He hates to see a boy the fool of books. Poor Silas, so concerned for other folk, and nothing to look backward to with pride, and nothing to look forward to with hope, and so now and never any different. Part of a moon was falling down the west, dragging the whole sky with it to the hills. Its light poured softly in her lap. She saw it and spread her apron to it. She put out her hand among the harp-like morning glory strings, taut with the dew from garden bed to eaves, as if she played unheard some tenderness that wrought on him beside her in the night. Warren, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. Home, he mocked gently. Yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course, he's nothing to us anymore. Then was a hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods, worn out upon the trail. Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. Warren leaned out and took a step or two picked up a little stick and brought it back and broke it in his hand and tossed it by. Silas has better claim on us, you think, than on his brother? Thirteen little miles as the road winds would bring him to his door. Silas has walked that far, no doubt, today. Why didn't he go there? His brother's rich, a somebody, director in the bank. He never told us that. We know it, though. I think his brother ought to help, of course. I'll see to that if there is need. He ought of right to take him in and might be willing to. He may be better than appearances. But have some pity on Silas. Do you think if he'd had any pride in claiming kin or anything he looked for from his brother, he'd keep so still about him all this time? I wonder what's between them. I can tell you. Silas is what he is. We wouldn't mind him, but just the kind that kinsfolk can't abide. He never did a thing so very bad. He don't know why he isn't quite as good as anyone. Worthless, though he is. He won't be made ashamed to please his brother. I can't think Sai ever hurt anyone. No, 
but he hurt my heart the way he lay and rolled his old head on that sharp-edged chair back. He wouldn't let me put him on the lounge. You must go in and see what you can do. I made the bed up for him there tonight. You'll be surprised at him how much he's broken. His working days are done, I'm sure of it. I'd not be in a hurry to say that. I haven't been. Go, look, see for yourself. But Warren, please remember how it is. He's come to help you ditch the meadow. He has a plan. You mustn't laugh at him. He may not speak of it, and then he may. I'll sit and see if that small sailing cloud will hit or miss the moon. It hit the moon. Then there were three there, making a dim row. The moon, the little silver cloud, and she. Warren returned, too soon, it seemed to her, slipped to her side, caught up her hand and waited. Warren? She questioned. Dead, was all he answered. There we go. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful little poem. And um, very clearly a, a huge influence on this game um, and highly relevant to what goes on with Conway. Yeah, so the, the, the core thing that we're going to see in Act 5 is... Um, the poem's emphasis on the nature of home. And this is something that we're also going to get in the interstitial at the end. Um, that seems to be the core thing that the creators have taken away from this for the end of the game. Uh, aside from the fact that the interstitial does mimic the dialogue of the, the poem, uh, you know, whereas like, uh, in the earlier part of the game, the poem was clearly an inspiration for Conway's character. Um, yeah, absolutely. I guess we, we might as well, um, while we're on it, we might as well kind of describe that, that parallel in the final interstitial uh, where the it, it's, it's just a single shot of like the television above the bar in the, um, the lower depths. And the, the dialogue reads out in the sort of lower corner as um, I think it's, it's Harry Carrington and Emily are sitting around um, and Carrington's commiserating himself for failing to put on the play, The Death of the Hired Man. Um, but the, the structure of their dialogue kind of uh, mirrors the, the content and structure of the poem in, in ways that Carrington doesn't seem to realize, uh, which is, was, is quite amusing. Yeah, the janitor uh, we saw earlier in the game uh, at yeah at Brandon at the uh, the underground storage uh, who saw Conway collapse and hit his head um, is the like the hired hand in the interstitial. Uh, Harry uh, takes on the part of Warren, uh, and Carrington takes on the part of. Uh, Mary, yes, Mary. Yeah, Carrington takes on the part of Mary. And then um, Emily is just there. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, well, it's because a bed quilt rambler has to be involved in every one of the um, interludes. Yes. <laughs> well, it, it, she does have some important dialogue, but it's kind of exterior to the dimension of the, the interstitial that's about the poem, or like that is enacting the poem. Because the irony is that Carrington spent all, wasted all this time trying to stage this play, but then at the end he ends up living it. Mm -hmm. He ends up living the poem <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I guess we'll return to that point uh, maybe at the end when we talk about sort of the nature of home and what the act has to say about it and what uh, the, the the interstitial has to say about it. Absolutely. Um, so Act 5 opens on a, uh, we don't get a cold open this time, actually. We just get the initial title card, um, Act, uh, Act 5, Scene 1, at uh, town. Uh, and then we get this gorgeous shot of sunlight, um, flood water and buildings, um, that evidently this is a town that has been, uh, laid low by a flood. Um, as the camera pans down, we see Ron from, uh, Pueblo de Nada, um, walking up to a kind of indistinct object that becomes more clear is actually uh, a dead horse. He sighs and um, as we pan down to see Shannon and Clara uh, with their antiques hauled up from the silo. Uh, and they, they, it's the last of it. They finally got everything up to the surface. 
Um, we're above ground. Ezra's hanging around. Ez- Ezra, Ezra wants to uh, play games on Shannon's phone, uh, but the battery's dead. Um, oh, well, you, you can uh, actually select the dialogue there, and uh, I, I, I had him ask to call Julian, and uh, Shannon is like, Julian has a phone? And you can just be like, yeah, of course. I mean, of course, the giant eagle has a phone. What are you, like, what are you talking about? I guess for me, um, I, I, the way I've done the structure of the notes here is kind of like an on-rails sort of thing for all the options I chose, because I guess I have a very specific cosplay thing I want to do in Act 5. You know, there's there's very specific plot beats that I I like a lot. Uh, but there, there are dialogue options all over the place here, and you can, you can choose which way Ezra goes uh, and so on. Um, it's good to be above ground, you know? Finally. It, it, bizarrely, it's the scene of a disaster, but it, it feels less dystopian um, than a lot of what preceded, you know, like, uh, right? That crushing atmosphere in Act 4 is, is absent, um, and we, we can finally... Also, like, they, they make such a good job of, like, rendering the light and the atmosphere. Because, like, you know, in, sometimes in a video game, you get the sense that there's no air it's just this like vacuum that they're walking around in, but there's definitely air here, and there's there's water in the air. It's it's heavy and wet atmosphere um, that's appropriate for after a, after a rainstorm. It's just it's gorgeous to look at. Not even kind of uh, it, it won't get off track here, but does one thing that was interesting about playing uh, all five of the acts and the and the uh, the, the various uh, uh, I want to say intermezzos, but uh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> like, uh, but uh, I, you know, like like you know, I, I remember reading online. I was like, you know. Uh, uh, just to prep for the uh, getting back into the game, you know how people you know noted that one thing is so bizarre, almost bizarre for this, even in like the kind of episodic indie game space, right? Is just how much time they took between some of those acts. Um, one thing that's really interesting about that, though, is that uh, if you play them through, you really see the extent to which they they really develop technically. Um, uh, whether or not it's um, whether or not it is, they all became better game developers through practice or artists or or, or that they just got more resources because they're able to sell the first, you know, a few installments to pay for the next ones, whatever it is. Um, and this was this felt like the culmination of that. You're right because um, uh, it, it no longer the world doesn't feel flat, uh, and it hasn't for a few acts. Right? It feels it lived in and, and 3D, and and you can really get that. You're right. That sense of both the light and the moisture, um, and the 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 you know the warmth of the sunlight. Right? You really feel. Um, 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 in, in, in this, uh, from the opening on of this act, you know? Absolutely. And the, the color, the color in this thing is just astonishing as well. Yeah. Yes. I think the only thing for me that was lacking, uh, in terms of the visuals is it really could have done with some like, uh, heat shimmers, uh, like to demonstrate how hot it was, uh, because, um, you know, I know this is in the South and stuff, but, and like, I understand, like, you know, being in a very hot place next to a giant puddle that's fa- uh, uh, like uh, formed because of a flood and having like everything just soak down, you get this incredible humidity, which like I'm familiar with from living in Japan. Um, but visually, that wasn't really conveyed to me. And I only really felt it or like I only really noticed it when they started commenting on the heat, Uh, because when I first saw it, I was like, oh, it just it feels like this, like, you know, like this wonderful, crisp morning uh, when you come out of a cabin or something in the forest, you know, Uh, that that was the impression I got initially. Uh, but then I realized, oh, that's not the right impression. There, it should actually be just like swelteringly hot. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are some other technical issues, like you know, like you can't. There, there, there are no Avenger skins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> for I searched, I kept looking for the shot. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? Where's my DLC? How do I make Shannon do the floss? You know? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, exactly. they could at least put it in a loot box. Right, oh, and they geez. charge me eight dollars or something, right? <laughs> which is which is you can, how you can tell that this is amateur hour, right? But that the, the the lack of the lack of the shimmer and that. 
they're just not taking their revenue model seriously in this game. They're not, um, yeah, they're, yeah, they're not maximizing it as product. Yeah. Um, I will say, though, that the, um, the water in uh, this uh, act is incredibly impressive. Uh, the reflections, the, uh, the way it, it deforms when you run through it, uh, the way that the, the reflections are dependent on the depth of the water, the, um, the depth and speed at which you run through it, uh, also, uh, aff affects how much it splashes. Um, like these are things you don't see in video games. Uh, like, like that's just not a thing. Like they will, they will put like a little effect or like a particle effect or something that will like spawn around your character's legs. But to have this kind of like sense of the water actually like deforming and moving is extremely rare. And, and, you know, there's almost a parallel there between the way the and maybe I'm sure this is perp. Well, maybe maybe it's not purposeful. I don't know, but it, it feels like it could be like the parallel between the themes of um, the themes. There's, there is like a theme of, of people trying to have a kind of, I guess, unalienated, autonomous sort of like artisanal production in the wake of deindustrialization um, and the wake of, of just this hollowing out of the capitalist economy and, and through the capitalist economy in that area. Um, and, and you see that I mean, this game itself is an art, uh, clearly an artisanal production. Like, I mean, when this game, when, the, when Act One launched, there, uh, there was no not the explosion of indie games um, and early access Steam games and all of that stuff that, you know, 12 years later, that's just commonplace. Most indie games uh, or so-called indie games, I think that would become big on early access and Steam. I suspect many of them would have uh, – uh, uh, might ha don't even have the attention to detail that you see in kind of every shot, every frame. And so that, that the, the, you know, the ability of this kind of – uh, yeah, you, you you know this whole act takes place in one space, but it, but every inch of that space um, really shines and feels lived in, and you get a, you really feel like you're like you're in that place a little bit, you know. Um, they can put that attention to detail and that artistry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, it's 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 gorgeous, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I probably say this pretty much every one of these episodes, but you can you can imagine this taking three or four years to complete. You know, it's. It's very feasible. Um, yeah, so um, now that they've got the uh, antiques hauled up from the from the silo, um, they're wondering where Dogwood Drive is, and they're agreeing to split up and look around. Um, at this point, it becomes evident that you're not controlling any of those characters. You are controlling a little black cat, uh, who is the cutest fucking thing I have ever fucking seen. It is... Mm, this, this cat is real good. This cat is from the boat, right? From the mammoth? Maybe? That makes sense. Okay, I hadn't put that together. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's not, uh, like, native to this place. It's, it's, an, it's a newcomer just like, uh, just like the other characters are. That's real good. I, I had not put that together, but that makes all the sense in the world. And that's why none of the um, residents of this town... Uh, they, they never say the cat's name or anything. They don't seem to be familiar with it, actually. Yeah, and it, and in my playthrough, the cat did like you know st kind of struck up a little friendship with the white cat that did indeed seem to be uh, a resident of the town. Um, so as you move this cat around, it's uh, we also get a sense that this is again doing the single fixed camera in a high place in the center trick. They've, they've been building to this forever, um, and this this whole thing is technically one shot. But like they do these little. Um, I think three times throughout the, the play of this, they'll do a little cut to like a, a black title card. It's not really a title card in the sense that we've seen, but they're little phrases. And I, I think that's just for like a garbage collection. Basically, they have to tidy up objects on the screen and change the lighting. But otherwise, this is basically one continuous shot through the whole thing as you track this cat around. Uh, and the mode of interaction here is that you could walk up to something and, and meow, con converse with it or whatever, you know, converse with one of the characters, or... Um, just to play out this like these like dialogue things that are that are happening uh, for for narration, um, this this town is is very strange. It's there's a spiral sort of mound in the center, and that's again because it's it's half flooded. It's kind of interleaved with the the water, um, 
At the center of the the spiral is a the hole. This is the silo of late reflections. Um, and Johnny and Junebug are standing there, uh, remarking on the weird music that is coming up from the hole. Um, you can meow into the hole, and it echoes quite nicely, uh, which, I, which I love. Uh, yeah, and I also just love the glyphs. Oh, no. Yeah, they're so good. The, the cat glyphs uh, that, like, sort of, like, visually represent the tone of the meowing that you are going to do when you click on it. Uh, it it's super cool. They're perfect renderings of uh, of, the, of the the inflection of the meow. Um, so uh, the the trick here from for moving the narration forward, I guess, is that as you pan the camera around with the cat, um, you're not really experiencing time linearly. It's like you're kind of experiencing little snippets of things that are happening. Um, so you, you get these tiny little vignettes of like, you know, Shannon is talking to someone. Uh, at one end of the town, but then if you if you pivot all the way around to the other side, she'll she'll be on the other side talking to someone else, and it's as if it's just this. It's a day, right? This is just a day that evolves, and all these characters are milling around, um, talking to each other, and these things are, things are happening, and you as a cat are just listening in on things. Um, so this is quite nonlinear. Uh, there are certain checkpoint events, but I get the impression that there are there are a lot of things you can see but some of them are going to be mutually exclusive. Um, and so I've only been able to document what, what I saw in the notes, but we can talk about anything that, that we remember happening as being important. Um, there's a lot of it that's not terribly plot important. It's a lot of like, um, there's an encounter where Ezra and Johnny are inspecting the pile of antiques and they find a toy robot that Johnny says he will fix. Or Junebug is hanging out with someone talking about motorcycles. A um, lot of slice of life stuff here. A lot of just easy pace. And, uh, you know, these characters deserve a break after the fucking nightmare they've gone through. And would you would either you say, like, one thing I, I'd be interested in your perspective on is to, to what extent the the structure of this town and it's kind of the way that it's set to you're supposed to you really are. You get the impression as the cat, you're supposed to spiral around it. You're right. The time is not linear the, the, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and it's all in this, you know, as you said, this whole act is like was one big shot. Um, is there an aspect to that 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 is meant to? contrast thematically with the previous acts where like the previous acts you're always ostensibly someone's trying to get from point a to point b mm -hmm. with the exception of those little interact moments you're always trying to get from point a to point b and they get sidetracked and they you, you, you end up realizing that there's so much richness right in these little spaces in people's lives even when it gets kind of grim and these all these bizarre little bureaucracies and you know like like uh, uh avant-garde uh, uh phd projects and uh, weird little business side hustles created and the, you know, but this is the one act where you're really not trying to get from point A to point B. It's like they're there. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. And I think that the other thing that really stands out to me is uh, I remarked in the recording about act two, I want to say, um, how excruciating it is to uh move around as Conway like he's just so slow because he's you know uh injured in the the mine um and you know you're just desperately trying to go around to to get some medical care um and uh that contrasts so much with this act because you are playing as like the most nimble and energetic cat who has ever lived. <laughs> so you know, fast. like it's you're, not, you are just it's not a chunky. It's cat. like, yeah, it's like you are you are like. It, it reminds me a lot of uh, playing the old uh, uh, PS2 game uh, Okami uh, by uh, like Clover and Capcom. Like the way that uh, the way that Amaterasu uh, runs as the wolf in that game is really uh, similar to the way that the cat runs around in uh, this uh, act. And it is, it just feels so liberating and free. 
there's a there's a bounding in both of those games. Like they really nail the the movement of bound. I guess bounding <laughs> is that the right word? You know, like such good animation. Like this is hard to animate. They did a real fucking good job of making that convincing. Um, that good old that that good old uh, cat mocap. Mm. Put put the cat put the cat in a little suit. Uh, they, they spent two years trying to get the the, cat, the suit in, on the cat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, it's just. Uh, I'd believe it. I mean, what if they had just hired that? Uh, what if we found out after all this um, that they actually uh, just hired um, Andy Circus? I was going to say the same thing. Jesus Christ! Oh fuck! Um, I'm sure he could do that. Um, uh, but anyway, so like, as we as you can make this kind of circuit. Um, you can kind of, uh, not exactly talk to, but like sidle up beside Ron as he's attending to the dead horses, the neighbors um, that we found out about in on Pablo de Nada. Um, and he's, he's th- this is quite heartbreaking because it goes on over the course of the act, but he's like using a winch to drag them out of the, um, out of the water and will eventually like uh, clean them off and, and, and dig a burial pit. Um, yeah, that, that's such a great detail. Yeah. You can hear it before you see it. Yeah. Yeah, the the like the three D audio, like you could hear the winch in the distance. You're like, what's that? And then it's like, oh, they're using a winch to move the horse's corpse because, of course, horses are incredibly heavy, right? And they don't have a truck. Like they have a truck, but it doesn't run. <laughs> so it's like, like they don't, they don't have a pickup or anything like that. So like. Yeah, it's just such an interesting little practical detail here that was like, oh, that's what's happening. And it's it's so sad. Just that little click, click, click sound as he pulls them out. Um, As we go around, uh, we'll find Shannon, Maya and Clara uh, at the edge of this um, earthwork path, as it's called in the wiki. Um, There's a lot of dialogue here over this course of the thing about like people moving on. So like... Maya can say she's either going to head off to Chicago or she's going to hang around in the South for a while and look at more of these burial mounds. But she does remark that this is definitely not a burial mound. Uh, this is something else entirely. Um, yeah, which gets back to that point uh, in, in Pueblo de Nada where Emily is like, where, where the question is like, is this history? And Emily sort of hints at the fact that like, there's a lot of guesswork involved, right? And so, like, they thought it was a burial mound, but actually, it's probably not. No. Um, Marianne and Nikki are talking about, uh, basically, Nick, uh, Marianne's going to paint a memorial um, for the horses. Um, so they've, they've got the canvas out, and this is another thing that will change as time moves on. You'll get start to get more of a sense of what's being painted. Um, uh, there's an interesting little scene with Clara uh, remarking on a nameless headstone at the graveyard at the other end of town, um, which is probably maybe the grave of the out-of-towner, or maybe not. I mean, I, I would have thought they would put a name on that in that case. Um, but there's there's a very interesting line here saying that uh, still a burial is not only for the dead, uh, which is basically what we're going to see play out over this act. Uh, then there's a tree right beside the graveyard, and we get this the first of these very interesting different kind of encounters. There's a ghost sitting in the tree, um, and the dialogue that plays out is kind of like a description of this this memory, like a, a sort of an event in the past. They do something quite different here with the dialogue tree, where um, instead of selecting responses, because obviously the cat, cat can't respond to the memory of the ghost, um, there's highlighted words, and you can kind of highlight, you can choose the emphasis for for like how the um, how the memory plays out. This ghost's memory is quite odd. It's she. It, this this character is the seer. Um, she's remembering this thing with the earth movers and the draftsmen and how they were constructing the apparent burial mound or the, the earthwork path. Um, according to a plan or a map or a game that she has been concocting, um, or it's all three of those really. Um, so this, the, I, I can only assume that these, these people are the, uh, the indigenous, like original inhabitants of the town. Um, yeah. And they're, they're constructing some sort of, um, some sort of monument. Um, I guess we can say now, uh, is, is it worth getting into it now, what this what this is, from from the rest of these kind of, like, ghost encounters we get with the seer? Uh, well, I just, I just wanted to mention that uh, we also see uh, throughout this act a lot of references to fortune-telling 
methods of fortune telling and fate. Um, uh, so, so yeah, this is just one of the many uh, that we do see. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, so it, it turns out uh, over over the course of the act uh, with these kinds of encounters with the seer that the earthwork path is a it's a representation of a path to safety because even in those days this place flooded and they tried to get to a safe place via the zero basically um, and that this this was a a path that came to her in a dream or in the game right like uh, rolling dice and doing tarot cards and stuff like that. Um, to concoct this path. But the, the trick here is that th this pattern is one that you will see elsewhere. I think it's it's been it's been shown somewhere else in the game, but it's it's the path from the zero to the hidden location, the um uh, the campfire that we mentioned. Uh yes. So if you start if you start from the the landmark on the zero called the steps and you follow this the, this turning pattern, you will get to the um Fuck, why did I just forget the word I just said? Uh, the, the the campfire. I'm not terribly sure what to make of the campfire still. Like, But there's something very interesting here that they were... The seer was trying to navigate the zero to take her people to safety before the next flood came. And ultimately failed to do that. They were they were still wiped out by the, the next flood. Yeah. It's also a very hard place to get to on the zero. It's, it's hard even with a map. Um... <laughs> I think the seer mentions um, the diver as, as somebody who has gone on this expedition, but they're waiting for them to return to confirm that it actually leads, leads somewhere and that they're still waiting by the time the next flood comes. Um, so uh, definitely a tragic, uh, tragic little story that plays out in this weird ghostly way. Um, these ghost, ghost models are great as well. They're like kind of smoky, translucent sorts of, uh, sorts of things. They're walking around town very slowly, like actually in a way not dissimilar to the way that uh, – like the, the pace of Conway. Yeah, pretty pretty, pretty languid. Um, and that's, that's a lovely detail where very slowly over the course of the act, you start to notice more and more ghosts just hanging around, <laughs> uh, just, just pottering around uh, in the background. Uh, what do we got next? Uh, Emily, Ben, and Bob are se seated on a bench. Um, the turns out these are real people, and everyone else can talk to them. Why, why couldn't Conway? Um, and uh, the, the cat is, is in interjecting and thinks that uh, there will be more rain tomorrow. And it's doing that thing, like, like with Slow Mo, where um, you just have, like, you know, assertive meow, and then Emily's like, oh, really? You think so? It's, it's like, whoa, cat here says it's going to rain tomorrow, boys, you know? Uh, very cute and fun. There's a character, Wanda, who's asleep on the porch outside one of the houses. Um, uh, yeah, shrug. Uh, that, that, uh, she's um, uh, one of the people from the uh, Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces. Um, she's, sleeping off a, she's sleeping off a hangover that she got at the tiki bar down, t uh, down in the, on, on the... Uh... <laughs> oh, that's right. She's the, she was the one from the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces, just like kind of uh, three sheets to the wind or whatever. Yeah. I, yes. I, I, yes. I, I didn't think we'd encountered her before. I, I read her as being a resident. I mean, she probably is a resident of the town, but I, I didn't put that together. Yeah, that's, that's where she's from. Uh, it, yeah, there's, there's a, uh, at one point in the, uh, in the act, uh, one of her coworkers, uh, who you also meet, uh, at the bar, uh, is sitting beside her and, uh, will explain, uh, what's going on. And you kind of get to have a little dialogue about, like, why they're there. Um, you get to either say that, uh, they're basically just like looking for a place to cool off and, and recover, uh, or they were sent here to investigate um, this town as a possible reclaimed space. Very interesting. I didn't get that. I didn't get that dialogue either, any of the times I've played through. Yeah, it's definitely missable. Weird. Wild. I got to play this a couple of more times then. I, I did get that when she woke up. Yeah, she wakes up and yeah, I got that. Uh, uh, I played out the dialogue of her. Um, uh, yeah, we've been look. We've been what was like we've been looking at this plot forever or something like that, right? Or we've been looking at the wait. Yeah, we're basically waiting for them to get flooded out. And I don't really like. I mean, I'm very curious about the bureau as a, this weird bureaucracy of like, I, like is it is it like kind of like a gentrifying, deindustrializing, deindustrialized bureaucracy or or are they like what? Yeah, I mean, probably they're installing office buildings in fucking everywhere, you know. Well. <sighs> Like, yes, but, like, also they just kind of, 
there's there's something kind of like nonsensical about the way they do things. They're not operating according to the same agenda as the power company. Something irrational, yeah, certainly. But yeah, right at the end, she does kind of wake up and is like, she has a tape measure and is and a, a, a dictaphone and is like, you know, taking notes and is like, yeah, we're we're going to reclaim this. And Shannon can be like, hang off for a moment. Uh, but I, I never got the middle dialogue with uh, with her her pal from the bureau. So a lot of missable stuff in this. So this is going to be an incomplete read through, but hey. Um, there's a little scene with Ezra and Clyde at the hangar. Um, uh, Clyde is trying to fix the, the airplane. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically it. That, that, that's another thing that will evolve over the course of the day. He'll get the plane up and running again. Yeah, e Ezra doing that thing kids do where they try to be more capable than they actually are. Like, they try to pretend to be more capable than they actually are. So, like, you know, Clyde is sort of like, well, this thing's, like, purely manual like you have to control the wings with your hands you have to be pretty strong and Ezra's like oh yeah I could do that <laughs> it's like no yeah no no sweat Ezra's very well observed as a kid and Ezra's kind of been doing that all like all the game right where it's uh and and you kind of don't notice it because because he, he does seem to be a, re a reasonably capable kid in the sense that he's you know survived this insane magical realist uh Kafka, sometimes almost Kafka-esque um, a world, right? Like, um, or at least the bureaucracies sometimes feel that way. But like, uh, yeah, that that's that's a nice little detail. Like Ezra felt like I mean, like a lot of the characters in this game felt very well drawn um, and relatable, even while they're in these very absurd and and surreal and dreamlike um, situations. You know, there's so much character there. Like, even given that, like the the models don't really animate very much, and they're they're quite stiff, and like you just have you only have the dialogue to go off of. Um, but yeah, this, he's a very well-observed character, certainly. Yeah. And, and, you know, sort of, I guess, typically for me, I was like trying to follow Ezra around at every chance I could get, um, like where I was picking all of Ezra's de uh, dialogue options in, uh, in acts, uh, three and four. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting to see him sort of like suss the place out and get a sense of what he's going to do next. Yeah, definitely. And um, it's, I think it's just also very well observed to like have have a child just hang around and play, you know, and have that be a lot of the encounters actually involve Ezra just like hanging around and like bothering someone as they're trying to work, you know. Um, uh, right beside the hangar, there's a garbage truck with some ghosts beside it. And the memory there tells us of how the town, like the, the, the power company dropped off the garbage truck by an airdrop one day. And they were like, this, this thing's fucking useless. Like, first of all, we don't generate much trash. And also there are no roads. So where are you going to drive the truck to? Um, and the first mention of this, this effort having been better spent on the drainage problems, um, which, yeah, you can put two and two together and be like, oh yeah, this is why this place flooded out so badly. I just love the idea of like going through the expense of hella lifting a garbage truck here, but then being like, no, we, we can't put in a drain. We couldn't possibly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, to the other side of the hangar is WEVP TV, which is now a fucking just uh, soggy ruin. Um, there are ghosts there, uh, which the, the ghosts are basically Rita and uh, Elmo and Ron. Um, it's Rita's induction tour, her first, basically her first day at the station. But um, Ron has news that the power company is pulling out of town. Um, there's a nice kind of sense here where, like, Rita is kind of like, okay, that's bad, but there are possibilities here. Uh, like, if they're going to just pull out and leave us alone, that's quite good. Um, and there's there's a really good line that uh, she says, These were people, Rita decided, ready to step out of the company's shadow and build something of their own. Ron said the TV station would still be funded by court order. Could that be their anchor? Uh, so, yeah, bright side uh, to the bosses uh, fucking off. There's another really good line in there uh, where she says, uh, or she reflects that um, she wishes just for once that she could be present at the beginning of something, uh, which is very relatable if you've ever, like, you know, joined a community just at the tail end before it collapses. Um which is something I've gone I've gone through a few times in my life. So it it's 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 a very real and like poignant feeling. 
and then this this sort of it's sort of dawning on her that like oh wait like maybe this is the beginning of something that that definitely resonated with me because like um i think i've 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 seen a couple of sides of that in a couple of different ways um like you definitely have that that thing always of like joining a project or starting a job and like you're there's a lot of prehistory that you'll never know about like the the teams or whatever or the people who are involved um maybe there's a mythology built up there's a kind of folklore um and i've i've also been i've i i have occasionally been there for the beginning um and the the glory days you know and then had this you know the 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 project or the the workplace inevitably goes through a couple of ruptures and then you know new hires come on and they 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 don't know they weren't there for the glory days you know and it's it's hard to explain to them the significance of any of that sort of stuff um so you you get to be the ghost sometimes and sometimes you're 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 haunted yeah and i think like you get such a powerful sense of that in um that uh kickstarter united documentary that we covered on the show uh that sort of like yeah the 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 story of the founders uh also just really reminds me of um uh red mars uh like that that kind of like beginning story and then just like you know where all the other humans come to mars after like the, the the planet has been terraformed and like all of the like the old timers are just kind of like there and not really certain what to do with themselves because the place is so utterly different than when they uh, started yeah yeah definitely um i was also glad to see that slow mo survived uh, the flood uh, he's hanging out and you can have a chat with him and it's incomprehensible on both sides and it's it's fucking wonderful um you can almost cat, discern what cat and crow about. yeah yeah, there's so much character. <laughs> Again, there's so much character even in just the fucking like you know square brackets like uh, inquisitive chitters and then square back square brackets like skeptical meow. And I think ah, oh, oh, <laughs> you know, so good. It's because the the combo of the audio and the writing is so good. Oh, but the, like, have you talked in pr- uh, previous episodes about like? Just how like how good the sound design is, and <laughs> yeah. like like I've got a I've got a, a both 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 the score like whenever there's like a song like like a kind of old Kentucky bluegrass or a country or gospel tune or or just the the all the all the drones all like yeah the crow is a great example where it's like you know they didn't record the bird right like there's like I got a friend who. Um, is a sound artist, right? And I re- I recently recommended this game to her. I was like, you really should check this out because uh, it's so uh, like like really is a, a extremely creative use of sound, and the and the sound communicates a lot and speaks to the writing and the visuals in a lot of powerful ways. And that's a great example, like with the writing of the crow and the sound of the crow, and it, and it, you, you you almost do get a sense for what the if what the what the crow is saying you get a sense of the kinds of things it might be saying right and what it's and, and and what it's what it's intending a little bit right like it does work to an extent like i mean ben babbitt's a really fucking good sound designer and a great musician and like it, i think it speaks to like like what fully a third of the creative team is the musician and like sound design stuff like that's that's a full third of the creative effort here um yeah wow uh i think one thing that's really worth remarking on um in terms of the sound design for this act uh, is the way in which you get like all this kind of ambient sound, like ambient natural sounds or sounds of people working that really communicate the expanse of the space to you. But when you um, go to the memories, it has this kind of like droney synth music that plays uh, and that kind of like contrast of like this moment of new beginnings and sort of like, oh, what do we do after the flood with the weight of history that you get with that drone? Uh, that really hit me on an emotional level where I could kind of see what was happening, but it wasn't like there's a there's a way in which this act really like sneaks up on you emotionally like there's a lot of sort of subtle things that are going on that are shaping your emotional experience of it or at least that was my experience and that drone was one of them yeah totally um i definitely get that too um 
continuing counterclockwise uh, around this thing, there's a very strange looking building, uh, which is not relevant quite yet because nobody else is looking at it. Uh, slightly to the left of that, though, um, are a bunch of ghosts uh, where one of them is digging a trench and the others are standing around laughing and basically threatening him. Uh, this is almost certainly the out-of-towner um, about to get beaten to death by the uh, company goons. Was he beaten to death? I think he was... I think he was wor- I think he was worked to death. So, so when does has a poem about uh, 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 about him at one point, right? And in the previous interlude, that's what it was. Nikki tells says a poem, and and it's like uh, like died by human hands or or body broken by human hands or something yeah. like that. So I don't know if that's about the out of towner or not. But it could just mean that that they've worked him to, that they worked him to death or worked them to death. Or him, yeah. The thing that puts it over the edge for me right now is that um, there's a line at the end of this memory that the out of towner can sense them moving in. You know that they're closing in on him, and that. But I, I, I yeah, I, I think I could, I could definitely buy a reading where it's uh, overwork that kills him. Because the thing is, um, there's other dialogue in this act where they talk about how the out of towner. I think it might be from Ron talks about how the outer of towner was brought in uh to dig the ditch and like basically was worked like a slave to dig it and the rest of the the company town the community um sort of stood by and watched it happen um and that was a big part of what led to the workers' revolt after the out-of-towner died. Um, so I could I could definitely see the thing where, like, yeah, they were... Maybe they beat him to death, but maybe it was the kind of beating where it's, like, um, you know, very, like, uh, like the Ben-Hur ship. Uh, like, uh, where, where like, you, like, they're just, like, uh, like, beating a slave to make him work more. And then it's like, oh, we over, we overdid it, and now he's dead. You know, you've sold me on it, I think, because like the, the thing here with the threat at the end, it's it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that they killed him right now. It could just be that they also kicked his ass, and then tomorrow he drops dead from a heart attack on the job. Like, yeah, yeah, I think uh, maybe, now that I'm thinking about it, if it was an outright murder, it probably would have been lampshaded a bit more as that but the the dialogue does strongly suggest it was overwork slash abuse yeah there were there were definitely like some pinkertons around who were like treating him like shit that's clear i think that's clearer then yeah i'm 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 with you on that now i think hey kyle pinkertons are workers too don't (laughs) just like just 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 like police man i don't know (laughs) <laughs> I feel like the Pinkertons are the kind of worker that is like the the the, the worker that uh, dupes Conway into taking that drink uh, in Act Three. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that fucker. That, that's the kind of that's the kind of worker that the Pinkertons are. <laughs> so that's that's something we're gonna have to get Varen on to discuss. Does like does suckering a guy into into uh, drinking whiskey and becoming indebted to skeleton hell? It, does that count as commodity labor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that yeah, commodity is it value? Productive or unproductive labor? Is yeah, that the that's value the form? You know, <laughs> here we go. Um, when Ezra catches up with Nikki, uh, she is mumbling to herself and. Uh, Basically, he's like, what's going on? It's like, oh, I'm working on a poem, uh, which will be an elegy for the neighbors or the town or both, um, depending on your dialogue choices. Um, it's both, you know, that's the kind of theme for this this act is that they're burying both the neighbors and the town. Uh, away at the back, then, there is a library building, which is quite odd. Uh, it's very out of place because um, it has that kind of like uh, the architecture is very suggestive of like Mexico. You know, it's got that kind of alabaster kind of uh, stuff and like these big square kind of building with the, the arches and such. It's it's infested with parrots as well, which is very funny. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very uh, it's very Spanish America. Um, like, you know, you'd see that in like California or New Mexico as well, but not really in Kentucky. Um, yeah. Uh, but um this was this whole thing was interesting to me because we talked in the last episode about how um 
the geodesic domes suggested that there was a generation of inhabitants here from like the the 60s hippie era but the story of the migration from mexico was suggestive of um like late 19th century utopian socialism um and it seems like they actually did mash those th two things together because all of the memories we get about the uh, you, the experimenters um, are yeah about the experimenters are are or there's there's a sorry there's a memory about the experimenters that is um, in one of the geodesic domes. Uh, yeah, and obviously geodesic domes had not been invented in the 19th century, so... Unless the, unless it hung around for multiple generations, which doesn't seem likely, because the, the story here is that it collapsed pretty quickly. Does it... No. Yeah, it doesn't really suggest that. And there's, there's even, like, when... Um, when this uh, these memories talk about uh, uh, Fraser, the sort of like uh, you know like this uh, cult leader figure um, that seizes power over the community, uh, there's a lot or there's there's a uh, discussion about the the feedback sessions um, that I swear is lifted like directly from the hippie commune section in All Watched Over. Uh, by Machines of Loving Grace. Uh, yeah. So I think they're riffing on the both the Utopian Socialists and that that vibe from the 60s and 70s. Um, they just get jammed together. Um, it's just a little irritating in terms of sort of like the historical uh, order of things. Uh, but, you know, whatever. It, timey wimey. It's magical realism. Yeah. <laughs> That's what the Echo does to fucking shit, you know? Yeah. Um, Gets it all mixed up, um, but the memory here is quite interesting. It's um, there's somebody going through the library. This is this is the library building, um, and Fraser is on a power grab and a book purge, and so this person is trying to rescue some of the the books. Um, he's, it's this quite great, great great description here of like Fraser's experiments having a scorched earth quality to them, and so this is the this is the sort of venom that takes over the um, experimenters, uh, the Pueblo de Nada, uh, their their experimental society becomes kind of. Um, trapped in a feedback loop directed by this person who's who is doing it sort of in, in it's like by the by the letter of the law but not the spirit of it because the, the the spirit of his experiments is quite destructive but it's kind of within the form that the community can find acceptable and that's what allows it to go on for so long um it reminds me of when we covered that uh book uh uh the what was it the left wing origins of neoliberalism um uh and they were talking in there about how um when the market socialists in eastern europe uh came into contact with the chicago boys um they couldn't really like initially understand the malice behind what the Chicago boys were doing because it was like, Oh, this is just another kind of like economic experiment. And we're all just trying to perfect like, you know, the perfect economic system. And that's just what we've been doing in Yugoslavia or Hungary. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that sort of uh thing where it's like, you know, uh, like I, whatever it was, like uh, greeting one of these Chicago boys is like the savior of socialism, and then he just turn, turns around and is like, "No, I'm here to destroy it." Um, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of what I got out of this this library episode of like, yeah, if you have this like maximally open experimental community uh, where nothing is fixed. Um, you can just have someone turn it towards uh, ultimate self-destruction. Mm -hmm. It'd be the easiest thing to hijack. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, there's, a, there's a thing here then that I only got this time around and I hadn't got previously where Flora is here, uh, the, the little girl from the Museum of Dwellings. Um, Ezra can catch up with her and she's been on a terrible journey also tonight uh, in parallel with Ezra, um, which is, was really, really quite good. I think she hangs around then with the town, I think 
That's that's I, I, at least I think I saw her later in the in the act, or maybe maybe she doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. She hangs around, but uh, you you can sort of like the dialogue of whether she'll stay or go is is quite open. Yeah, I guess maybe that's just my bias there. Uh, same with Ez- same with Ezra. Yeah. yeah. So like, I think my bias here is to like because like it, it, almost all of the characters are kind of like entertaining like. Uh, where am I going to go next? Ah, I might stay here. This this seems like it maybe has legs to it. You know, maybe we could build a new community here. Um, my bias is towards having people stay, uh, except for like Ron, who seems like it seems like the right thing for him to move on, uh, and maybe some of the others. But like for Ezra and Flora, I can't really remember what I clicked on there. But like for for a lot of our main characters, my general vibe is that they should stay. But I I could imagine someone doing. Uh, something else with them too you're given the option at least it's one of the most hopeful aspects of the game is if you're leaning in that direction but those are there's a few dialogue options there i I think i i think there were a few choices in this act with different characters where you could say you know going kind of you know one of those sort of two paths and i think i i I, I, there was one character i think i remember um maybe it was clara where i was like oh i got a gig in tennessee and i'm like well that then it sort of feels like there's something with the music touring musicians maybe less so with than than junebug and johnny where they they're just kind of like they you know they're kind of making cool art and stuff right but they're very much stuck in this little thing and uh, uh, this little kind of uh, uh, magical, realist, semi-dystopian sort of spot um, that this could be a lot nicer for them. And they can build a little venue. They could play to people in the community. Uh, but, there, but there were almost a few people where I was just like, man, if you have a way to get as far away from this messed up zero echo situation as possible, like, I don't know if you want to take a risk. I just, I just worry that five years later, they're just back eating hagfish. And the... Yeah, totally. I think maybe, maybe the way I did it was that for the, for the people who had been here the previous night, like the, the, the residents of the town, I think I, I leant towards letting them move on. But then I, the newcomers, um, I kind of felt they could, they could set up shop, you know, cause that was the thing that was mentioned in the previous interlude that like, it seems that every time the community dies out, somebody moves, moves in immediately. Um, it felt just appropriate to do that. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I generally felt the same way. Yeah. Uh, Ron is working on burying the horses, and at this point he does remark that uh, he does blame the power company explicitly for neglecting the drainage around here and for abandoning the town. Um, and that I think he, he ruminates on this a bit over the course of the act, um, but it's, it's, it's stated explicitly here. Um, at this point, then, we can gather at the weird building, which turns out to be 5 Dogwood Drive. Um, the gang is there wondering what the fuck this thing is. Um, it's, well, the mailbox says it's 5 Dogwood Drive. And then Emily kind of walks up and is like, yeah, that just that just showed up last night <laughs> during the flood. Um, this is a very strange building. It it almost looks like a platonic ideal of, like, home. It's like a kind of glyphic representation of a home, but it's also just made of, like, marble. Um, and just sits there. It looks, it looks like nothing else around. Um, very strange visual. Yeah, it's not it's not clear exactly what the material is, but it's it's this very like uh it's like if you took the outline of a house and then just like extruded it in the z axis. Yeah, if you 3D printed a um uh, like a an icon of a house, but it was, you know, the size of a house. <laughs> it's the home button on your browser, you know, but like yeah, exactly. You know, it's fucking a 1000 square feet or whatever inside. <laughs> And yeah, it just showed up. Like, there's there's no explanation whatsoever for where it came from. This is Dogwood. Uh, very fucking weird. Um, also, the, the front and the back walls are missing, so it's like it's open to the elements. But when the gang steps inside, they feel that it feels warm and inviting, which kind of almost makes me think it's kind of a hallucination along the lines of the skeletons that like those people are not actually skeletons they just have this extremely weird vibe that is rendered to us as skeletons it's possible that this is in fact a house but to us it's rendered as this very strange ideal house maybe also there's also uh this might not have been purposeful at all but i I had a the way that it looks like just that the that bare skeleton of 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 the frame um, it, it really, one thing that struck me, and this could have just been me, uh, not intentional, uh, but was those, you know, those old, those images you see in, um, kind of historical drama in, uh, in North America, uh, of like a, uh, of like a barn raising. Mm, yeah, yeah, sure. Got you. 
yeah, which that's definitely so it, which, which 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 does give you a sense of kind of home, like home building community building which is which is one of the options you're given so again that could have been totally unintentional but that's that's what it uh, the, this game is so impressionistic, right? There's always things that strike you in ways that, um, you, like good good literature, almost. You know, like maybe there's something you picked up on that wasn't supposed meant to be there, but that's the point. You know, like it's generative, good art. You know, good visual art, same thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm very into that. That is a good read. I'm pretty sure, like, well, I guess there's no direct evidence of this, but. I'm pretty sure that the person who ordered the furniture for this house was Weaver. Oh, yeah, okay. And so I think Weaver may have, like, conjured this out of the void or some shit. <laughs> it, it, yeah, probably. She, like, 3D printed it or something, you know? <laughs> like, I would be surprised if, like, you know, when she was doing her hacking it in the TV station, she was like you know, doing, like, cosmic geometric alterations with the weird spiral to, like, you know, make this happen and create this place uh, where, like, you could literally just, like, walk into the idea of home. Yeah, definitely, right? I, I think that's, that's, that's definitely the... That has to have been who who ordered the um, the stuff, and that kind of just has to be who who actually created this thing somehow. Um, this because like over the years while I was waiting for these episodes to come out and waiting for Act Five, I was kind of just trying to guess what Dogwood Drive would end up being, and in my imagination, like what would happen at the very end of the last act would be that you would see the truck pulling up to a small like bungalow, a nondescript little house. And as the truck comes to a stop, the, you would cut to black, right? And that would be the end. I could never have imagined that this is what Dogwood Drive would actually be. <laughs> it's just so bizarre. I was terrified that it was going to be completely quixotic, actually. Uh, is that how you pronounce that? I can never make it sense because it's like coyote, but then you, you can't say chaotic. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, this... this there was this there was a terror around three or act four for me it's like there is no dogwood drive they mm -hmm. don't go anywhere and i guess in a way conway's quest could be considered uh, mm -hmm. chaotic or quixotic uh, uh but um but the fact that you know the, over those between two act two and act four if there is a main character it kind of becomes shannon right so like um and so to, to just the the, the feeling seeing um Dogwood Drive and that it was actually quite lovely and then the conversations they're having about you know it was it, uh, what they could do with it um, was actually one of the loveliest feelings it was really really warm emotionally warm emotional moment right um, like they're gonna oh someone could build something here and there there's a, there, there was a place it existed it, even, it didn't exist before last night right like yeah so that's it's a super important right because like they are discussing here it's like oh wow this could be a library or it could be a workshop it could be a community kitchen it could be whatever and you know they're they're really sinking and there's a lovely warm drone as well and it's just like the light is just perfect for these like there's a lovely communal warmth to this and if we think back to the when we finally got the dialogue from Weaver's broadcast uh, during Act 4, um, that she was explicitly trying to get through to Shannon to set her on a journey to a happy place. And she was saying, some of this will wash away soon, but you will be happy there even without the mail, the school, or the horses. Um, and so, yeah, this has to have been engineered by Weaver, that, like, Weaver wanted to send Shannon to a happy place, uh, sent her on this journey to the town, uh, the unnamed town, and also conjured into existence a home um, and ordered, you know, had the foresight to order, like put in a mail order for the furniture. Um, and yeah, Shannon is definitely the main character. And this whole journey is about her getting to this happy place. Wow. And of course, now, just now that you say it, I'm like, man, like act one, like, like, Sh Weaver tells Shannon to go to the mine um, where she meets Conway. Conway was probably the furniture was probably it could have very easily have been ordered uh, by uh, Weaver um, and then conjures the house like that. Actually, the all of, the, all of that that would put a lot of pieces into place um, and also make the whole journey. Um, just a little bit, a little bit uh, more um, uplifting, I guess. You know, or or yeah. you know, 
and, it's, and, and, and not just emotionally uplifting, but kind of intellectually generative. Because otherwise, it's like, imagine, imagine if it ended in Act 4. Right? Ooh, yeah, Jesus. Can you imagine <laughs> if they never got around to it, you know, um, yeah. for Act 5? Um, I also kind of think it's, it's really remarkable to, to reflect on how the events, like this, this took place over the course of, what, fucking nine years for me. But for these characters, it's, it's back to back, it's two days. Because, like, Conway, uh, it, that morning when having breakfast with Lisette, Lisette says, oh, we just got a mail order for this furniture. And he's like, fine, I'll take it out to Dogwood Drive. And then by the end of this act, we have sundown of the following day. So it's a full, it's a full two days for these people back to back as, as like the, the temp, temp the, the time of the main action here. Um, in this, um, in this scene, in this little micro scene as well, there's some interesting options for the dialogue. I think this is one of the only times that Conway is mentioned, uh, possibly, because like the, the dialogue I always go with is for Shannon to say that, you know, uh, you think more people will come after these people leave? I guess we'll be the first, right? Like that they're kind of, she's starting to commit to making something here. Or you have these less committal kind of options. But there is an option to have Shannon say that she's going to go back to the distillery after all this is done to bust Conway out. And then Johnny and Junebug offer their IOU that they got from Harry as maybe being helpful for that quest. I don't think that's a very satisfying option, but I could imagine people taking it. Um, well, it, it is. I have talked to people who really wanted that to happen because the thing was um, there were a lot of people for whom the mention of the IOU at the lower depths basically got into their heads the idea that yeah like you know Junebug and Johnny are going to save are going to save Conway by using this IOU and that, like you know he'll be, he'll be out of his medical debt because of uh because of this um and then being really disappointed that it goes in such an incredibly downer direction um so I definitely understand why they would want to put that possibility in there. Um, and it gives the character, the player, the ability to make that call, I guess, too, right? Like of how they see that playing out. Yeah, and it's kind of like the reason why that didn't happen in Act 3 from a sort of plot perspective is that, you know... Conway and Shannon walk into a church and then they're suddenly in the in the hard times distillery right and and uh Junebug and Ezra are just hanging around outside and they have no indication that that, that that they've gone in there so if they had all gone together they probably could have done that but uh you know it's it's a it's a uh it's sort of like the the the, the force of fate that that causes Conway to go down that like doomed road, um, and yeah, giving the player the option is is like well, you could kind of put a little bit of that agency back in their hands. Yeah, but but although I've you know there's something about Conway too is just like like and what makes him what makes his arc so dark and you know like I, I, I and like I was saying kind of implying before we started recording right and how there's a bit of a certainly a bit of an ideology critique aspect going on with Conway where it's just like bust how you, how do you bust someone out who thinks that the jail is 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 helping him? Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like I don't think Conway could be happy here. You know, I I. If Conway had come up to the surface here, he wouldn't actually be happy. He's almost only happy as a wage slave, right? Like, he is just, like, he really feels that he, he is not outraged. There's never any point in that game where if, if you get the, even the slightest inkling that he is outraged, that he has been so nakedly tricked, right? Like, I, I might be wrong, but I don't think it's ever mentioned that he's in debt before this game. Um, I, like, it's, like, he, like he, he gets completely bam, but, but it, you do get the impression that he w doesn't know what he will do at, now that, Lis now that Lisette's is closed. Um, he's, he doesn't really have any sense of what he'd like to do. Uh, there's never getting any ever indication of that. And he's just, uh, and he's just like, oh, thank God. I can't believe I was so stupid to drink this free shot of whiskey that was offered to me. And how could I have been so greedy as to go on a tour of this, of this factory that I 
didn't ask for. It's nothing to like, nothing to right? Like they forced me to go on in order to get the information that I wanted. And then at the end, it's just like, oh man, I can't believe they're so kind and thoughtful to have cut me a deal. Right? Like you can't bust that guy out, man. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was definitely a part of me that, um, again, in the run up to act five, I was kind of, I was kind of expecting act five to be another kind of like big action blowout sort of thing, like, like act three. And like, they would, they would maybe go, like, I was just kind of wondering what it would be. And it's like, oh, maybe they'll go and try to get Conway out or whatever. And I'm so fucking glad that wasn't it, actually. Like, this is so much better than anything I'd imagined would come in this act. And I think it's an, ex it's an extremely brave and, like, correct move to just move on and have Shannon be the main character and to have this warm place that she can settle down in where I, I honestly don't think Conway could have actually... I, I, Conway's too broken to live in the, in the new world, you know? That's, that's exactly it. This, he is... Um, he's somebody who runs from any chance at autonomy because when he gets to thinking about things, when he's not just working, it's so unbearable for him that he's just driven to drink. And then the only, and then, and then his alcoholism is so unbearable that the only cure for it is to go back into servitude. Because that's the only state he can be in where his life is tolerable. Um, so yeah, if he came to this community, it would be a disaster. Because he'd have all, all this autonomy, which he really, really does not want. Um, which, is, which is a striking uh, dis, uh, uh, difference with so many of the other characters we see throughout all the acts. Like even when there was some dy a lot of dystopian stuff going on underground, ground, right? Like one really common theme is you've got these intellectuals and, uh, and, and researchers and artists and all these sorts of people. Many of which um, – many of the, the people doing either this kind of small artisanal um, kind of pseudo-entrepreneurial activity – or who are uh, creating some kind of artistic um, a project of some sort um, are really it's like there there's this theme of people like gra like really building the space to have this kind of autonomous uh, activity and production and creativity um, in the interstices of the absolute ruin uh, 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 that uh, of 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 this kind of um, uh, post industrial kind of capitalist hellscape that they've they found themselves in um and so conway just doesn't fit with that whereas so many you know like like that comes through really clear with like june bug and johnny for instance right or the or the restaurant in act four or the, or even the tiki bar like there's a certain amount of pride that is going into those uh, uh, uh bizarre rum drinks you know like and the uh, i i think i think what I think the game in that way is kind of gesturing towards uh, Richard Florida's The New Class um, in in that the like the creatives exist apart from simple proletarian labor. But it also doesn't gesture in that direction because nobody who goes down this road is going to be like, rich and with it in, you know, the center of a global city, taking part in global citizenship and driving up property values. To, uh, yeah, it's like, like, like someone has to create the postmodern taco shop because like who was going to, yeah, exactly. Who's going to sell postmodern Japanese style tacos to, uh, you know, like the, the, I don't know, the coder from EA or whatever is moving into the neighborhood. Right. You know, they might make robot constructed postmodern pancakes but they're not ever going to be successful in any conventional sense because of that. Not, not in any way that's valorized by capital, right? Yeah, exactly. Because the, the, the strong argument is that the only places that utopia can exist in this world are places that are abandoned by capital, not ones that are one and have their own kind of like thriving viability yeah um i i kind of i, I kind of love how subtle the class stuff is in this game because like um 
I mean, especially if you kind of contrast with the, like, you know, the kind of old socialist stuff, right? Like, there's, like, Con Conway isn't really a kind of avatar of the, um, like, old factory working class, but he, he's kind of made to stand in that way, I think, as we were discussing in the, in the green room. Um, because the factory as a job site in this game is not the place where people go to be emancipated. It's where dreams go to die and get enslaved to skeleton hell. And... But it's also not saying, like, this kind of PMC thing. Um, it's not kind of doing all these other kind of shitty class analyses. And what, what it ends up with is something that is kind of really... It has its finger on the pulse of, like, class dynamics today. In that, like, all the workers here are precarious, lumpenized, you know, pushed the peripheries and stuff. And there is a kind of, like... Um, yeah, a sense that, like... You know, you're not going to put on a flat cap and go to the factory to, like, have the red dawn kind of come washing over you. That, like, instead the kind of escape from capital and escape from the bosses is can be found in actual escape and ab even abandonment. That, like, once the bosses have been ran out of town and things are abandoned, you can live free of their influence. And it's But it's not a, like... Uh, it's, it's almost like a kind of collapse sort of thing. This is a post-collapse society in this town. Um, yeah, it it has um, like sort of the flavor of the the '90s left of like how to change the world without taking power kind of stuff, um, but it's not very optimistic. You know, it's it's very it's, it's almost like an end notes of thing watered down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's very circumspect about what that offers. Right. It's like, you know, you could. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can build community outside of capitalism by not taking power, but it's like always at the mercy of the whims of capitalism and it's not going to be able to sustain itself very long. The only thing that sustains it are like is basically like this ghostly motive force of utopianism. Well, that's it for this episode. Join us again next time when we will finish our mini-series on Kentucky Route Zero. In the meantime, you can catch us on Twitter at GIUnitPod. We're on Facebook, we're on all the podcast apps, so like, rate, and subscribe. You can also go to patreon.com slash generalintellectunit and give us a couple of bucks a month to get access to our community Discord and to support the show. This show is part of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast network and research collective. Go to emancipation.network and check out our sister shows, such as From Alpha to Omega, Mortal Science, Jumpsuit Utopia, Swampside Chats, and Varn Vlog. They are excellent shows and excellent folks. As always, thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show.